in this class we want to look at the balance sheet. Um, we want to look at all of the aspects of the balance sheet, at least in an overview fashion, just to give uh, a flavour of what it's about. Um, it is, in fact, a financial picture of the standing of the company at a particular date. It's, it's a summary of all of the accounts, of all of the financial information that's related to the business at a particular date. The balance sheet is calculated uh, using the accounting equation, that is assets equals owner's equity plus liabilities. That's very important and that should be remembered. Assets equals owner's equity plus liabilities. The balance sheet discussed later shows that the assets are at the top of the account. That's a procedural thing. The design of the balance sheet uh, has changed over the years and as we'll see towards the end of this session that um, the way it's done now the assets are presented at the top of the account. You'll see what I mean when we get there. Under the assets section the liabilities and owner's equity figures are produced and these figures amount to the same as that of the assets. That's pretty obvious from the equation above. So the owner's equity and the liabilities are equal to the assets. Now let's look at some of the, the terms that appear uh, in the, the balance sheet. First of all, assets. Well, assets may be classified according to their liquidity. Liquidity means the ease with which assets may be turned into cash. So cash is the most liquid asset. We say cash is the most liquid asset. Um, a house is not very liquid. A house, it takes time to sell a house. There are legal issues in selling a house, uh, surveying issues. Uh, the buyers have to negotiate the price. It takes time for the contracts to be exchanged. It's not very liquid. Cash is the most convenient. It's the most liquid asset. But we can range all assets in terms of their liquidity. Ranging from cash as the most extreme, that is the most liquid, to something which is very illiquid. Perhaps an oil painting or some some obscure piece of asset. Most assets involve time and expense in order to convert them into cash. And as I said, cash is the most liquid. We say cash is perfectly liquid. A house, on the other hand, is not liquid since it takes time and expense in order to convert the house into cash. In this way, we may classify assets according to their liquidity. We may also classify assets according to their type. For example, current assets, fixed assets, and intangible assets. And let's look at these. Three types of asset. The current assets. Well, current assets are cash and other assets that may easily be converted into cash. So, for example, a bond, or perhaps a government bond or a debenture from a big company, a big reputable company, sometimes what we call a blue chip company. These are easily converted into cash, easily uh, put through the market and sold off. Sometimes we say that current assets are assets that will be used within a year. Um, maybe a time dimension. It's a bit vague but it gives a feeling. Current asset, current means time in some respects and a current asset is going to be used up within the year. Okay, so it's, there's that element to what we mean by a current asset. Both of these views are uh, a little arbitrary. In practice we simply classify some assets as current and other assets as fixed and then we adhere to these classifications. So fixed assets and current assets. Let's look at fixed assets. Like our current asset definition, fixed assets are defined as assets that are held for longer than a year. 
again a time dimension. Example of fixed assets are land, buildings and equipment. These will be fixed assets. Fixed assets may decrease in value every year and this should be taken into account. We could call this depreciation. Um, we do this by allowing for the depreciation. In this way, uh, and this is a way of uh, distributing the cost of the asset over time. So if you buy an asset, a piece of machinery, today, as you use it over time, it becomes less valuable. We use depreciation in every time period to reduce its value until eventually it's just a scrap piece of metal or a scrap machine. It may still have some scrap value, but it's not worth what it was at the start for sure. Now let's look at intangible assets. Intangible assets cannot be touched. They're not. That's why they're intangible. They are not physical assets. And examples of intangible assets could be patents, or sometimes called patents, franchises, copyrights, trademarks, goodwill. These are assets, but we, we, we can't touch them. These intangible, uh, intangible assets confer a financial benefit to the company and should be taken into account. They are real, they have a real value, it's just we don't see them as things, we can't touch them. Now, types of liability, well we can identify four. Well, one needs a bit more explanation than the others. Liabilities are simply classified into current and long term. Uh, current liabilities are debts that will have to be paid within a year. It's a current liability. It must be paid off pretty soon. It's a current liability. Long-term liabilities are debts that will come due in one or more years. For example, long-term liabilities are mortgage repayments and bonds. Uh, a long-term liability in our own personal lives may be when we purchase a house. We have a mortgage. It's a long-term liability we have to look after it over perhaps 20 years. Owner's equity. Uh, in a limited company the owner's equity appears as shareholder's equity. This in turn contains two sub-classifications as follows. The capital stock. In, uh, this includes the amount that shareholders invested in the company. So the capital stock is part of the owner's equity and retained earnings. This is the increase in the value of the shareholders equity arising out of profitable trading. But really the business owes this to the shareholders. It's, um, <coughs> if you like, it's a liability of the business to its owners. Its owners who put in the money, uh, the business owes that back. So four types of liability, the owner's equity being in two parts. So we got current liabilities one, long-term liabilities two, and owner's equity in two parts. Four types or three types depending how you want to count it. Now let's look at um, an example of a balance sheet. Um, this is one for a company called ABC Limited and it's drawn up on the 31st of December 2000 and whatever and on the top we have the assets they're in thousands of pounds we have fixed assets fixtures and fittings land buildings motor vehicles plus the depreciation on the motor vehicles which gives us a net value of the the motor vehicles of 1500 and 96. We put the cursor onto the screen so we can we can see this. There, 1,596, which is the the value of the motor vehicle, not very expensive vehicles. Anyway, less the depreciation gives us that. Uh, so the total fixed assets are, if we tot this one up, we get this. 5,021. 
and the current assets are the stocks, what we have in stock, the debtors, the repayments, and the bank, which is that. And intangible assets, goodwill, 3,000. So add this lot up and we get this here. So remember, make a note in your in your minds of 9345, 9345. Let's look at the bottom part of the balance sheet. For a start, immediately look, 9345, it's the same figure as before. And this time we got to it by current liabilities, trade creditors, salaries payable, tax dividends, overdraft, current liabilities. Long-term liabilities, the ventures, add those two together. Capital, this is the authorised share capital, which is that much of £1 each. That's what you're allowed to issue. When you set up the business, you uh, have an authorised share capital. That's the amount, the maximum amount of shares you can issue legally. You don't have to issue all of those. You can have the issued share capital, which in this case is just 2000 Profit and loss, that. Retained earnings, that. Tot this column here up, and you get 5880 Add that to the 3465 gives us that, which is the same as we had before, which is the accounting equation that I mentioned at the start. Um, I said at the start also that the uh, there is a format for the balance sheet. Uh, this may not be very clear on the video but um, that is the format for the balance sheet. As you can see the assets are at the top and the liabilities are underneath. And That's the way it would appear on the accounts. And you can see here again clearly that 9,345 equals 9,345. That the assets are equal to the liabilities and owner's equity. That's the equation. Okay, that's, um, that's an overview of the, the balance sheet. So hopefully that was an insight into that particular and very important account. Okay, thank you for watching. In this video we want to talk about the resources of a business. Um, in their famous book Johnson & Scholes on strategy they say that strategy is the direction and scope of an organization over the long term which achieves advantages for the organization through its configuration of resources within a challenging environment to meet the needs of markets and to fulfill stakeholder expectations. So we're going to look at what is meant by resources here for the business and have a, an overview of the meaning of the term and what exactly or what precisely constitutes the resources of a business. First of all we have the financial resources. Uh, financial resources concern the ability of the business to finance its chosen strategy. For example a strategy that requires significant investment in new products or distribution channels or uh, production capacity, working capital or whatever it is. These will require uh, financial resources to put a pressure on the business finances and there needs to be financial resources to enable them to be uh, pursued. An audit of financial resources would include uh, assessment of the following factors. Um, cash balances, uh, bank overdraft facilities, bank and other loans, shareholder capital, working capital, for example stocks, debtors already invested in the business, creditors, suppliers, the government and so on. So looking at financial funds requires some sort of net picture out of these various components and when we include all of those we get some sort of at least one side of a picture of 
financial resources. Now the ability to raise new funds, well that also is it's a financial resource. The strength and reputation for example of the management team, that's a resource and that can enable the business to pull in resources from banks or from lending agencies. Um, so it's a strength. The relationship between the investors and lenders, well, that's a str possible strength. Attractiveness of the market in which the business operates. Uh, if it's a new innovative market riding a trend, that's um, it's like a a resource. It's it's a financial resource. It enables the business to uh, project itself in a very positive light and makes it easy for the business to raise finance um, from banks or from investors. Listing on a stock exchange. Uh, it may be a possibility. Some companies, when they get to a certain size, a certain reputation, a certain resource base, uh, the next step is to float on the uh, on a, a stock exchange, issue its shares on the stock exchange, bring in new money, new investors and so on. There's also human resources in a business. Um, nothing happens in a business unless people do the things in the business. Um, a business must have people otherwise it's uh, nothing will happen and this means that there there should be some sort of skills audit uh, what does the business already possess what sort of skills do the workers have and are they sufficient to meet the chosen strategy if they're not what sort of plan is there in place to upgrade the skills and can the skill base be flexible or stretched to meet new requirements? What about f uh, future expansions or new innovations coming into the market? What sort of planning is required to enable the human resources in the business to enable them to effectively meet the challenges of these new products, new innovations, new the changes that are coming in the future? And an audit of human resources would include an assessment of uh, the existing staff resources, uh, the number of staff, the functions, the location, the grade, the experience, the qualifications, the remuneration. Uh, is this existing rate of staff loss? How many people leave the business, don't find it attractive or want to move on or and why? Why is this happening? Overall standard of training and specific training standards in key roles. Are the people equipped to handle change, to handle the market needs as the market needs change? Now and in the future, in international markets, in the light of um, innovations, technical innovations, so are the skills being updated? Uh, and also what about the intangibles, morale and the business culture? How is the business seen and how do the people who work for the business relate to it? Changes required to resources. Uh, the organisation should really look at the nature of the skills required and the the gap between the existing skill sets and the required skill sets. So what, if you like, what incremental human resources are required? What additional human resources are required? And are the people flexible enough to, to take those on board? And that might mean some sort of budget for training. Um, employment, it might mean even outsourcing. If if the skill sets are not available within the business, perhaps uh, certain functions should be given off to other companies that have those skill sets. Perhaps a joint venture um, where two or three companies co uh, collaborate to make a, a particular product. This often happens, for example, in the airline industry 
when new and expensive airlines are being planned. There's also physical resources. Um, the category of physical resources covers a wide range of operational resources concerned with the physical capability to deliver a strategy. Now these include production facilities, um, the location of existing production facilities, the capacity of the production, the investment and maintenance required to ensure that the production facilities are up to date and competitive with what's available in the rest of the market. Critically looking at the current production processes to see if they can be upgraded or greater efficiencies uh, achieved with the existing configuration of capital or configuration of overall physical resources. Uh, what are the qualities and methods of organization associated with the production facilities and the extent to which um, the production requires uh, a strategy in itself to enable it to efficiently handle materials from the point of entry to the point of exit as a new product. Um, so it's the totality of the production system and how efficient that is. There are also marketing facilities, marketing management processes and distribution channels. How effective are, are those being handled and uh, what sort of criteria or standards of judgment or standards of assessment are set out so that the activities within those departments are benchmarked against the standards and some outcome uh, assessed by senior management. And of course the perennial information technology. Um, to what extent is IT integrated with uh, customers and suppliers. What is the supply chain? How is it integrated? Does it use networks for example to facilitate efficient movement of goods, information, services? Um, again a physical resource and needs some some thought is needed to uh, to consider its implications. There are also intangible resources. Um, it's easy to ignore the intangible resources, um, but they are very, very important. And these include goodwill. That's the difference between the value of the tangible assets of the business and the actual value of the business. In other words, what somebody would be prepared to pay for the business. If the business has a book value of a of one million dollars or pounds or euros or whatever and somebody is prepared to pay two million pounds or dollars or euros or whatever the difference is goodwill that's what the the company is is worth in the mind of the the purchaser the goodwill the reputation of the business as well how how is it seen within the community? How is it seen within the market? <clears throat> what are its strategic objectives and, and how do they accord with the overall uh, view of business within the community, within the country? Um, how does it relate to its employees and how does it relate to the community? The brands. Um, these are often strong key factors in whether a growth strategy is successful or, or a failure. Um, what brands does the business have and how recognizable are the brands? And intellectual property. Well, intellectual property is the ownership of the rights, the patents, the trademarks or the patents as some people say the patents or the patents and the trademarks that are associated with the products. What um, what protection has the company got 
to stop people, other companies, perhaps even in foreign markets, from copying the goods. Um, there has been a problem in many countries for many years of fake items being imported and sold on the market um, to replace the genuine product. Well, obviously that's not fair. The, the people who came up with the design originally had to spend time and effort, money, to, to generate those designs. Then they were successful in the market, after successful marketing, uh, only to have their products copied, perhaps, and fake items put into the market. It happens in, in many businesses, in music, in films, in clothing, in leather goods, in many areas. Um, but the protection of the intellectual property is complicated, it's expensive, but it's a necessary expenditure to protect the, the brands and the image of the brand and the reputation of the business. So those are some of the resources of a business, um, ranging from financial marketing and so on, right down to the intangible resources of the business. So that's a backdrop on the types of resources that uh, we should be aware of when we consider uh, business. This concludes our video, so thank you for watching.